Right, thanks for uh, coming back for this last session uh, of the morning. Uh, and thanks again for coming along and joining us for this, uh, for this session on new territories. Uh, my name is Matt Ball, and I'm the head of sales uh, for Intershop in the UK and Ireland. Um, just in terms of what we're going to cover in this last session, uh, we're, going to, we're going to look at some real-life uh, war stories. So this is all about a couple of companies who are leaders in their arenas, uh, who've done some interesting stuff and have some facts to share on, uh, on exactly what they experienced when they went into new territories and new markets and how they went about that. Um, just before I introduce our two speakers, I wanted to give you the what, where, and how of Intershop in three easy steps. Uh, Chris Jones from uh, Dr. Martins earlier said uh, it was all about having a global directory and local assortments, and also Bianca mentioned that uh, you need a platform that supports local sizes, variations, and what I've written down as peculiarities. I don't know if that's the appropriate phrase, but uh, that's effectively what, uh, what Intershop does. Uh, we're an e-commerce platform company. Uh, we provide the software that powers uh, the likes of Next in more than 50 countries, uh, Harry Potter's eBooks in more than seven countries, because they've just gone live in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, Majestic Wines, who've just gone live in France, which is very exciting, and uh, companies like Mex, who've gone uh, international. And because we're a German company, we're very strong in the uh, German-speaking markets. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, the size, we've got 500 customers, and uh, through our platform, there's about 200 million euros uh, worth of uh, transactions that go through it on a daily basis. Uh, so uh, that's enough about us, most definitely. I'm going to introduce you to the first of our two speakers who's going to share some insights. So Paul Giafredi, who asked me not to do my Italian accent when I introduced him, uh, is a seasoned finance professional. He's worked in a number of businesses, including uh, AIM-listed companies and technology companies. Uh, he moved to Baker Ross uh, five years ago. Baker Ross is uh, uh, a crafts and arts uh, business. And, uh, and he's been helping them not only in finance, but he's, uh, he's done some interim marketing and operational work as well. Uh, so please welcome Paul to the stage for his presentation. Thank you. Is my mic working? Yeah, I think it is. Okay, thank you. Um, Baker Ross. If I can get a slide to get there. That's our logo. I mean, the first thing that's obvious, we're not in fashion. All the other retailers this morning, you've got great brands. We're something completely different. Um, we basically have our own brand, our own design of craft products aimed at primary school age children. Um, these are things for them to do that can be based around many themes, such as Halloween, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day, etc., etc. Now, a bit of background about us, because I'm sure most of you probably wouldn't have heard of this. Are there any parents in the room? A few? Yeah. All right. We aim at five to four to eight-year-old kids. That's our range. If you haven't had kids yet, you probably wouldn't have had much reason to engage with our products. Um, unlike these big brands, we're quite a small business. We're a family-owned business. I'm not one of the family. I'm hired help. We're an SME, and we don't have any shops whatsoever. We basically purely sell online from our warehouse based in Walthamstow in northeast London. However, we turn over about 18 million a year. We only have 80 staff, and half of those are in the warehouse. So at least 40 people to deal with customer services and all the clever stuff such as product design and marketing. We have two brands for historical reasons. The main brand is called Baker Ross. The other brand is called Yellow Moon. Baker Ross originated, and it used to sell a lot to schools. Uh, so we had a big B2B part of the business. But over the years, the school's business has grown, but the consumer side of the business has grown much greater. So Baker Ross is now mostly B2C as well, whereas Yellow Moon is all B2C, but has a charitable fundraising element in its marketing proposition. So when people buy our products, we give money to charities such as uh, Childline, Click Sergeant, people like that. So it gives people a, a good feel about buying stuff from us. Um, last year, we did 450,000 orders. But the main success of our business, we do sell things like glue and paint and what you call craft essentials for kids. But where we really make our money is on the theme products. And we have a team of designers who sit in offices in London, they sit on Apple Macs, and they design great, unique, original craft products that no one else basically sells based around themes. And this is where we make our money. And the great thing about those is they're designed here, 
made in China, and that gives us the leverage to make 70, 75% gross margins on those products, despite the fact the products have maybe only a three or four pound price point. Marketing, we're a small company. The background was mail order. But things have changed greatly since the days of sending out catalogs or getting people to send postal documents back in and type them into the system. Now nearly all of our orders come on the internet. Um, about 90 odd plus percent. The only people who really don't order on the internet from us are schools, who for whatever reason, schools don't like using the inter internet very much. They like sending us faxes with county council logos on and purchase order numbers. We wish they wouldn't, but that's where they operate. We mainly use now pay-per-click advertising to drive our new customer acquisition, but we still use catalogs to sell to people on our marketing database because that is a very cost-effective way to still do that, but we're cutting our spending on the offline stuff greatly every year and spending more and more on the online as we find that catalogs, you have to cut the size of them to make them still efficient. On social media, we've expanded quite a lot in that in the last couple of years. The products we sell, crafting, people like to talk about. They like to show what they've made with the kids. They like to put it on Pinterest. They like to uh, write blogs about it. They like to do it on Facebook, on Twitter. So our products are very good for people to talk about. I mean, our typical customer base is probably 25 to 44-year-old female with kids, but some of them might be childminders or people working with kids. Now, historically, the business has been virtually all UK-based. Uh, we had a trickle of exports from what we call expats, British people living abroad who went, oh, I remember Baker Ross, we'll order some stuff off them. But we really didn't have a clue what would sell abroad. Um, but we thought we need to go overseas because we actually think our products are great. They're branded great and they're really good products, really good value. But how we were going to do that, we didn't really know and we had a very, very limited resource. And one of the reasons we had limited resource was the three people we do have in marketing, that's all we've got, spent all summer migrating our e-commerce platforms to the Magento platform. So basically we had no bandwidth to do it with them. So I stepped in um, and we basically decided we would use online marketplaces as a way to test for our markets. The, the Javelin guy did a great presentation earlier, and you can look at all these graphs and you can say, well, Japan's hard and Germany's easy. But ultimately, you don't know whether your products are going to sell or not until you kind of put them up for sale. So we took a view of a very kind of suck it and see or put your toe in the water approach and find a cheap way of putting our products into different marketplaces and seeing if they sold or not overseas. We did have a good experience of online marketplaces in the UK. We were on two online marketplaces and we did 60,000 orders in the first year and we're on, we're on track for about 110, 120,000 orders this year. So we thought, okay, we know enough about those marketplaces to leverage them to go overseas. We made a decision to go international in June and we set ourselves the target of being live on three countries by September, which was a bit of a tall order. But nonetheless, we're live on two now, and we'll be live on the third this week. Our products and their price point create considerable challenges when you're selling overseas. Our typical price point is 2.99. I quite envy the chat from Dr. Martins, where your stuff goes for 80 quid or 100 quid a go. If you're, if you're lucky, yeah. <laughs> Ours goes for 2.99, and we also know that the average order value is quite low. Typically, on a marketplace, it might be 10 to 15 pounds. On our own e-commerce sites, 30 to 50 pounds. But that creates challenges in that it really isn't economic for us to offer free PMP because it will eat up too much of the product margin, make the orders unprofitable. And we felt that we couldn't go for a six or a seven pound international delivery charge if the average order value is going to be 10 to 15 pounds. I think Hobbs mentioned six or seven euros earlier. That wouldn't really work with our customers, we felt. So we decided the way it was going to work was we were going to set an international shipping rate to Germany, France, or whatever, which was compatible with domestic shipping rates e-commerce suppliers were selling craft products in those marketplaces already. And we felt that would remove a barrier, an obstacle for people to actually buy with us. Um, we decided to focus on our own brand products. Not everything we sell is own brand. Paint is a generic commodity in the crafting business. But we've got about 2,000 own brand, own design products. So we decided to focus on those products, because we know on those marketplaces, no one else would be fighting with us for the buy box or whatever it's called. Our, our listing would stand on its own. Um, that did create a lot of work for us on translation because we couldn't pick back anybody else's 
copy. We had to create our own copy from scratch. So that created cost and effort. And also we felt we needed our product packaging to, have, to be upgraded to include foreign languages and various international regulations and certifications. One of the challenges we have is that we're in the toys business and there is an awful lot of regulations about what you can and can't sell in different countries and whether it has a certain type of plastics. And if a three-year-old swallows it, are they going to die? You know, it, it just creates lots of, lots of problems. <laughs> and, and there's the issue of insurance because you know, different countries have a different uh, attitude to suing you if you kill their children, not surprisingly. Um, choosing product for overseas markets. Um, a lot of what we sell and where we make most of our money is seasonal ranges, but we decided... <coughs> If we just went for the Halloween and got that translated, those products are a bit like a supernova. They kind of sell fantastically for five weeks, and they've gone. So we needed to pick evergreen stuff that would sell all year round so we could get an idea from the experience what really worked and what didn't. We focused on the Baker Ross product, and we knew from our experience on UK online marketplaces what sold well on marketplaces, because some stuff sells well on marketplaces, doesn't sell on our site, and vice versa very well. But we wanted to make sure it was cost-effective to ship. So we basically went through our product list and went, okay, anything weighs below 250 grams, we'll have a look at those. And we picked products with an average weight of 100 grams on the assumption if someone bought 10, that would weigh a kilo. And the one thing that's different from UK shipping and overseas shipping is in the UK, generally speaking, unless you're shipping below two kilos, it's the same price whether it's a three kilo, five kilo, 10 kilo, or 15 kilo order. Most of the carriers, it's a fixed price up to 15 kilos. When you ship overseas, every extra gram typically costs you more money. You have to factor that into whether it actually works and you can make it cost effective. Anyway, we did that and we also worked out a lot of the products could be put in a jiffy bag and go through a letterbox, therefore people wouldn't have to stay in and wait for them because no one really likes to stay in and wait for someone to sign. Gave us a few products to start with. And the first country we picked was Germany. And why did we pick Germany? Gut feel, lots of Germans, 80 million of them. We think they're e-commerce savvy. I'd seen one or two of those javelin graphs before, so I kind of knew they were in the top right-hand corner, sort of. <laughs> so, so we thought we'd do Germany. How did we do it? Um, very cheaply is, is the short answer. Basically, we had 150 products copied. We f I found an outfit in Leipzig who specialised in doing translation and setup work for people taking their product overseas on online marketplaces. And that cost me 1,900 euros, which is not a lot of money, which is a good start. Went live beginning of August. Wasn't the best time, because everyone's on holiday. The Germans go on holiday to the beach as well. However, we quickly found sales were quite interesting. We're getting 50 orders a day very quickly during August. And knowing what the seasonality of our products is, we knew that we'll be doing hundreds and hundreds of orders a day come November. So we thought, hmm, OK, and there's some legs in Germany. But we did learn a few things as well, quite quickly as well. The Germans like things to be on time. <laughs> they are quite particular. You know, the English people, they don't care if it's seven or eight days, a bit less they fare, really. The Germans, if it's meant to come in seven, it comes on the eighth day, they'll write you a review saying, good product, but it was one day late. <laughs> and, hmm, OK. And you don't want to upset them because you want them to order again. Um, we also found that certain products sold which we didn't think would sell. Well, we sell lots of craft products, and we did have a, a, a range of owl-themed products, which I've got some pictures for coming up. Why did owl-themed products sell so well in Germany? Five out of the top six sellers are owl-themed. I have no idea. If there's any German people here, they can tell me afterwards. But it's like, okay, well, that was interesting. And also, it was language search terms. And we, we use keywords on our UK online marketplaces that people will search for. And we try to second guess what they're going to search for. Literally translating craft into German might give you craft. That, that, isn't, that isn't going to be the word they use. Probably they're going to use something like Bastel for Kinder or something like that. So it's working out those keywords that will work for the Germans and they'll then find your products and then they'll sell. Um, we have made some quick changes already. We changed the parcel delivery company we're using first because they were cheap, but we found someone as cheap, but all we have to do is pre-sort all the stuff into a sack or, or pallets for Germany. We pre-sort them, we get the same cheap price, but they'll get delivered hopefully quicker. Well, they are being delivered quicker. 
And we thought, okay, this is promising enough to translate lots of our Halloween and Christmas range because this is our, our best time of the year. Owls. <laughs> Can't get enough of them. No idea why. So, you know, you can have sewing kits, you can have notebooks, you can colour in your mug, you can have another sewing kit. But um, the sewing kit sells brilliantly in Germany. No idea why, but okay. Second country, USA. Everyone wants to kind of do the USA. It's a huge market, um, but, and there's no language issues, but we had issues with the states historically. We were nervous of it. First of all, the Americans sue you if you injure their children. Our insurers were not overly keen on us going to the states. Uh, the, the product liability insurance cost goes up quite a lot. We've got to consider that. However, we were getting people who were using our YouTube channel and our Pinterest channel as well, saying to us, well, we like your product, but you can't sell them to us. Why don't you sell products to the States? And we're going, oh, okay. Yeah, fair enough. Because we didn't realize that 70% of our YouTube views when we set up a YouTube channel to show people how to craft, we'd never appreciated 70% of them would be Americans. But they were. So, okay, we thought we'd give the States a try. How do we do it? Well, we didn't translate the US copy. We thought that they might tolerate us using the word you in colouring. So colouring pens, colouring kits, we thought, oh, the British quirkiness. So we didn't bother, so we just used exactly the English copy and incurred no cost whatsoever. We went live about two weeks ago. Um, the first thing we observed was the daily sales were lower than Germany. Uh, and the first thing we kind of spotted was, say we've got a great range of Halloween craft kits for kids. If you go to that marketplace in Germany or the UK, there might only be low hundreds products, and our products will quickly rise to the top because they're very relevant. In the States, you might be looking at 1,000 products. So you're going to get less page views was the first thing we observed. What have we learned? Um, well, we do sell religious-themed craft. And we sell a bit of it in the UK. The Americans like, as far as I can observe from my trips there or watching documentaries by Louis Theroux, would be they like religion guns and sex, but not necessarily in that order. But guns and sex really are totally off-brand for us. We're not going to have, you know, make your own Kalashnikov craft kit. It just, it just, it just wouldn't work. It just goes completely off-brand. So, but religion sells. We've learned that. So we're going to look to expand our religious offerings for Sunday school crafts and things like that. But we also learned it's a tougher market to crack. It's just getting yourself noticed there is more difficult. So what are, what are we doing to try to give ourselves more profile of our brand? We're trying to leverage our social media. We're making people aware on our YouTube videos that they can get this product in the States now, not just the UK. We're also making that in obvious on all our, all our product pictures. People tag product pictures on Pinterest. It's now available in the States. We're tagging those all up as we speak. And we've got a great blogging network of people who love talking about craft in the UK. We give them product. They talk about it. They're promoters. We can, we're going to get Americans to do this. We have had Americans who've approached us, but we thought we're not selling our own bother. But now, now we're doing it. So quick learnings. Yep. Um, Jesus, God, love. Yeah, they love it. <laughs> <laughs> so they're very like us, the Americans, but they're far more religious. Third country we picked was France. Um, again, top right-hand corner of the Javelin presentation earlier. Uh, large economy. Lots of people online, we think. Shipping distance short, bit of gut feel. Um, how do we do it? Um, we use the same outfit who do the translations <coughs> for the online marketplaces. Uh, we went for 450 products because we thought the German stuff started so well. We'll do the Halloween Christmas stuff right from the start. Um, that cost 3,000 euros. So that was my big upfront investment. And we're going live today, tomorrow. The products are just being uploaded now. So we'll see probably by the end of the month, early October, we'll have a pretty good feel whether the French like our products as much as the Germans, whether they like owls or whether they're into jungle animals and stuff like that. We just, just don't know yet. What next? Um, well, these are all just a toe in the water, really. It's just a way of us to find out, firstly, will people abroad actually buy our products? Are they relevant to them? And give us a guide to where we should focus on next. So it's a toe in the water, and we need to make a decision by Christmas if we're going to go down a different country route, and we're going to get a foreign domain and a foreign language website, we need to make that decision by Christmas. 
and then get on with it and do it and get it done right. But fortunately, we've got between now and Christmas to make lots of mistakes on these marketplaces and find out what our customers do and don't like without really damaging our brand at all because people will associate our product with the marketplace rather than our brand. But it does give people an introduction to our brand because all our products are clearly branded on the marketplace as our own Baker Ross brand, our own design brand. Um, other things we might do in the interim is we changed our websites to Magento platform very recently. We're going to throw a foreign currency pricing onto our UK websites hopefully in the next month so people can have everything priced in euros or US dollars. Then we can leverage our experience of UK pay-per-click marketing in English to try markets like Australia, possibly the States. I think the States might be expensive, but Australia might be quite cheap because we already know that some people buy our stuff and then sell it in Australia. So people order 5,000 pounds of our stuff, have it shipped to their house. Uh, we don't market to them, and then they, we find they put it on their website in Australia and they're selling it. So there's got to be a market for us there. We just need to exploit that, and the exchange rate makes our products a typical three or four pound price point in Australia in dollars. Our prices would be very, very cheap. So that could be good for us. And the other thing we need to do between now and Christmas is work out which products we might need to look to change for product development in 2014. If we find that the Germans like festivals with masks, I think it's something called fashing or something like that, if we can develop some craft kits based around kids getting masks on and doing that kind of stuff and that sells well in Germany, we should do it. So we need to learn those things from our experiences on those marketplaces, but it's a kind of do it all in three months, get live, see what happens, see what works, and then build the e-commerce sites after that. And that is Baker Ross. Just one question, please. So, thanks very much for that, Paul. Sorry. Interesting stuff. I have one question before we hand over to Matty, which is, yeah. um, uh, which marketplaces and how do you ring-fence your stock to make sure you don't run out uh, on selling something over here that you've committed over here in the UK? Okay, we don't really have that problem. Um, we feed all our product through all our marketplaces through um, a company called Channel Advisor, who deal with all that product feed for us. So we, we, do, we, we upload the data, it goes to them, and then it goes on. So we've got one product allocation which is shared amongst all those marketplaces. So basically, it's hard to run out. Right. Also, we typically will, because it's our own brand, own design, and it's manufactured for us in China, we will typically have five to 10,000 of these things each product made, and we hold it all in our warehouse. It all comes in. It's all here now. We're unlikely to sell out of many of the best sellers until probably a week before Christmas. Good, good problem to have, mate. Nice problem to have, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Right, Thanks thank a lot, you. Paul. Okay, so um, uh, in order to shock and awe you uh, with our final presentation of the day, uh, we'd like to ma welcome uh, Matty Curry to the stage. And uh, since you have his biog uh, on your piece of paper there, I thought I would introduce him um, via a piece of eavesdropping that went on earlier today. Uh, he's going to be appearing in the Telegraph uh, women's section uh, uh, later on this month, I believe, and he's going to be described as the cock one of the sex toy industry. <laughs> so with that, I give you uh, Matty Curry. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Cock wan. Or cock wang, if you like. Um, yes. Anyway. Um, ee. Uh, I'm Matty Curry uh, from Love Honey, and uh, this is going to be a bit weird. Um, firstly, because I feel really bad for debasing this marvellous room and this beautiful mural that is around us until I notice the tasteful nudes in that corner. Um, that man has no genitals. Uh, anyway, um, yes, because uh, this presentation will feature some rude words, and pictures, I know I've got the time wrong. Um, so if you are of a squeamish nature, then you've come to the wrong show. Um, right, so uh, who are Love Honey? Um, Love Honey are the UK's uh, largest online retailer of sex toys. Um, reasonably large company, it's essentially us and Ann Summers. Um, we sell more sex toys than they do. Um, but we're not just Love Honey. Uh, we are lots of other businesses as well within our group. We are Blue Bella, which is essentially a copy of the Ann Summers party plan business. Uh, we have the delightfully named Cock Locker. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also have uh, Head Night HQ, which is essentially anything pink 
glittery and tatty uh, that you want for your hen night, you can buy from us. Um, we have also, uh, within the last... Uh, I keep looking at this, I shouldn't look at you guys. Um, we have also, within the last uh, year or so, bought a, a company called Coco de Mar, which is a, a luxury uh, erotic boutique in Covent Garden, uh, which is very exciting for us. We've never done shops before, um, so we're still learning about that. Uh, we've never done luxury before. Um, how do you sell a £2,000 gold-plated butt plug? <laughs> I do not know. I am finding out. Um, but yes, but, but those are boring, boring UK sites. We're not here for that. Um, we are here for all the fun international stuff. So we have uh, two international sites at the moment. Um, France and Germany will be coming shortly. Uh, but we have lovehoney.com, um, which has been with us for about a year. And we have uh, lovehoney.com.au, notice a theme, uh, that has been running for the last uh, just under two months. Um, now, so... Uh, those are our sites. Um, so, but when you kind of you're, you're looking at where you're going to go, um, as Mr. Javelin said, you kind of look at uh, you know the, the culture there and the people and the broadband and whatever else there is. But you also have to look at the marketplace. How mature is the marketplace? And the reason I've kind of done .com and .com.au is because they're very different markets in terms of their maturity. So, in in the States, uh, it is a very mature market the sex toys industry. Um, the first sex toy store wasn't done in the States. It was actually done in Germany, a company called Beata Usa. Um, but the second sex toy store uh, was Good Vibrations in San Francisco. Um, and then uh, in terms of sites, you've got Adam and Eve, great big ass site, uh, Eden Fantasies, who we may buy, um, and uh, Babeland, which is all very nice and very lovely and very friendly and uh, very uh, female friendly. Um, in Australia... You get this. This is the number one sex toy site in Australia at the moment. Wildsecrets.com.au. And you're looking at it and think, well, that's a bit noddy. Um, and it's a bit kind of slightly porny. Um, and that is essentially what the sex toys market is in Australia. And a lot of e-commerce in general in Australia is a bit noddy still. Um, is there any Australians in the room? I don't know. <laughs> um, but it is. It's a bit noddy. Um, we can actually deliver to Australian addresses faster and for free than most Australian e-tailers can. And as you think, what the hell is going on here? Um, so that is great. That is a great, great market for us to go into. Um, and so, well, let's ignore Australia for now. Uh, let's look at the US. So, so you're entering a new market. Um, people don't know your brand, completely new brand to them. So how do you differentiate? Well, the first way you differentiate is through product have product that you can only get on your site, right? Um, and you think that would be easy for us. But it's not, because we have a bloody wholesale arm at Love Honey, which is selling all our stuff already to Australian retailers. Um, so the, we have our Happy Rabbit, which is our flagship rabbit vibrator. Uh, we have the Squeal, which is a wheel of 10 silicon tongues that goes round and round and round and round and round. Um, that, that is the winner of, a, product, of a, a competition we run every year called Design the Sex Toy, where whatever twisted things your mind can imagine, you submit it in and we give you a thousand pounds if we end up making it. And then we give you commission. The guy who's made it is like a freaking millionaire by now. But um, <laughs> a lot of people like that toy. Um, so that's, that's a bugger for me. Another bugger is that um, Love Honey is the global license holder for Fifty Shades of Grey. So we manufacture all the toys, pharmaceuticals, lingerie for Fifty Shades of Grey. Great in the UK, because I can have an exclusive on the site. No bugger else is getting that stuff, but not in the US. Where kind of, you know, it's, we don't want to just sell it on our site, because we won't sell any, because it's a brand new site. So we have to kind of go out to these bigger sites. So I can't have any exclusives on the US site. That is buggering me. I use the word bugger far too much. Um, so, um, question for you, thinking about kind of national tastes. What is the number one type of sex toy in the UK? Anybody. <laughs> rabbit. Rabbit. You're right. Rabbit. Right? That was a fun photo shoot. Um, the rabbit <laughs> is the number one type of sex toy in the UK. And some of us have their rampant rabbit. Rampant rabbit is a trademark, by the way. Um, we have our version, uh, which is the happy rabbit. It's lovely. Um, what is the number one selling sex toy in the US? 
Fine, vibrator. This. <laughs> this is the Hitachi Magic Wand, which isn't even a sex toy. It's a personal massager. Oh, so I thought, yes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so you think, right, so, you know, I have to kind of sort out my different products for different, um, different countries. And there's different tastes as well. So there's a reason why that is the number one selling sex toy. It's because it's powerful. That plugs into the mains. <laughs> Americans like power. The UK, sort of like cheapness, to be honest. Um, Japan likes design and single use. Single use disposable sex toys are a big thing in Japan, and they come in like vending machines and whatnot. And so you have to think about kind of different tastes. Um, but it's interesting in the sex toys world, um, what do these two products have in common um, that cause a problem that you don't have if you're selling dresses? Plugs. Each product will have a different plug, and these are hardwired plugs. Not in that case, but there are. Um, and so you end up, when you're trying to kind of fulfill to different territories, you can triple your SKUs, essentially, because you have to have a different, a different kind of plug for every single product. And that's, you know, that's screwing our warehouse, essentially, trying to you know, send out to all these different countries. So, but that's fine. We can fix that. So we know about the type of market. Uh, we know what sort of products they want. What sort of people are they? Now, um, when we were looking at what kind of countries we wanted to look at, um, and I've sort of been preempted on this by Paul, but never mind. Um, we go out to different countries, we look, and we look at Spain. Spain, Spain looks great. They've got tons of visitors, and they convert really well. Let's do Spain. But when you actually look at the customers who are ordering from you, and the terms they're using on the site, they're all expats. So don't just trust the data alone in terms of where you're going to go next. You know, obviously fish where the fish are, but make sure you know what sort of fish they are. Um, also, in terms of your brand, why are people actually buying from you? you know, if you are a British brand, don't bother trying to turn yourself into an American brand if they're actually buying from you because of your Britishness. And that's certainly um, the case in, in certain Asian countries where they actually are looking for that Britishness to buy into. And so when we were looking at kind of our other territories, we asked our customers in those territories, why do you buy from us? What makes us special? What can we kind of capitalize on? And they said a couple of things to us. Firstly, they said, you know, free delivery. You offer us free delivery, which is unfamiliar in our territories. Um, and that's something that Love Honey always says. We try and make delivery free no matter where we ship, and we ship to most countries. Um, and secondly, you have lots and lots of reviews. And when buying a sex toy, um, you kind of go by the reviews. I mean, we can, as Love Honey, can say, oh, yeah, buy this, it's great. But that's not as a compelling argument as if someone else is saying, buy this, it's great. And we have the, the world's largest database of sex toy reviews, so about 50,000 of the damn things. Um, and so, right, so we have this information as to why we are buying from us. And so we can roll this into our marketing. So here is an example. Um, this is uh, searching for sex toys uh, in uh, Australia. As you can see, there's world secrets. Um, and then there's us. And so we've got, we, we speak specifically about the number of views, and we speak about free delivery. Now let's look at America. Do you see any ads for Love Honey there? Make a quick no, you don't. Um, there's a reason why you don't see any ads for Love Honey there. Firstly, because when I took this screenshot, it would have been about 3 o'clock uh, in the afternoon um, in, I think I do it by Texas. Um, and so we, we kind of optimise our campaign because people don't buy sex toys during the afternoon. Um, it might be uh, because of kind of geodemographic stuff, so it's actually illegal to sell sex toys in Alabama. So we have to kind of you know, exclude Alabama from that. But that's not the only reason you are not seeing a Love Honey ad there. Let me talk you through some prices. This is for a generic term on PPC. Now, I'm not going to tell you which one, but for us, generic terms are things like dildo, vibrator, bullet, whatever. Um, in the UK, 
It costs us £1.19 per click to get someone to our site for this generic term. And that gets us into position 1.5, which is normally one top spot. In Australia, we spend the equivalent of one pound and six pence. We optimize our campaign because we, we kind of work on a, uh, a target ROI of three for our, for our kind of, uh, for our PPC efforts. And that gets into a position of 3.2. In America, we spend one pound 92 on this term, and that gets us into 4.9, which in some cases doesn't even get us listed. That we, we miss a good 70% of impression shares, even though we're paying nearly double what we get, what we pay in the UK. The US is bloody expensive, quite frankly. And so when you're trying to kind of build your, your market in the States, PPC certainly for us, ain't the answer. And so obviously you look at kind of other things. And, and SEO-wise, the first bit of, inf the kind of first tip I can give is get your href langs and your little rel alternatives in your XML sitemap as quickly as possible. I completely, I didn't even know you could do that, which essentially says everything that I have on my UK site, everything that I'm ranking for, here is a complete analog of it on another site. Essentially like well canonicals, which means you, all your link juice that you have in Google UK then applies to your other sites nearly automatically. And I completely miss that. So uh, you can't do PPC. So what else can you do to build your traffic very, very quickly? So <laughs> sorry about that. So firstly, let's look at what you would do as a startup. What do you do to get your business known? Well, firstly, you look at affiliates because that's people in your, in your kind of industry, in that territory, who know the sort of market and can kind of advertise for you. Um, this is Heya Pephora, um, and this is great. This is the sort of affiliate you want who will promote you and promote you in a kind of on-brand way. But let's be honest, there's not a lot of those sorts of affiliates on the market who actually put the effort in. Where you're going to get the volume, and it's horrible, and it's bottom feedy, but it's going to be on the cashback and coupon and voucher code sites where there is sheer volume. And you wouldn't do this as a big, well-known brand because you don't, you don't need to get people to your site. But when you're not heard of, you just want volume, volume of orders and getting people in to know about you. But it's not just orders that you want when you're kind of growing a new brand. And this sounds insane, but it's true. You won't get an order straight away for an international customer, because they're going to research you, they're going to be weirded out by buying from an international address, they're going to take a little while. So you want all these little micro transactions along the way. Can you get them to sign up to your mailing list? Can you get them to create an account? What can you do to get some information, build that mailing list up in volume as much as possible? Can you go out to kind of third parties, look at their mailing lists? Can you, can you buy data as much as possible? And this is the really nasty bottom feedy stuff. Can you do lead gen? Can you essentially go into competition sites? Just build up that database as much as possible. And when you do have all their data and you have these people, make sure you actually keep them on the site and transacting with you. Now, when we were kind of doing lovehoney.com and lovehoney.com.au, we were so bloody relieved to get these goddamn sites live that we forgot about all the other stuff that makes the .co.uk love honey so great. So we forgot about our, our lovely welcome campaign. We've got a, you know, a timed welcome campaign when you start with love honey that kind of explains you through the journey. We, you know, we, we give you uh, discount codes when it's your birthday, when it's your anniversary. We have this kind of whole community aspect. We have all this stuff that we just didn't have on the international site straight away because we thought, oh, God, on to the next thing. And you have to make sure, if you're actually now putting effort into building up your lists and your kind of you know, customer database, that you do all the good stuff that actually gets to keep them. PR. PR is great. PR is great and PR is cheap. And it's certainly a lot of fun for Love Honey. Um, every year, we do a thing called the Sex Map, uh, where we take all the kind of cities in the UK and we, uh, we rank them 
by how much they've bought with love honey divided by the population of, of the town. Uh, so top 10, uh, number one is Fleet in Hampshire. Um, the bondage capital of the UK is Wilmslow in <laughs> Cheshire. Um, and this is great because this means we can localise our PR. So we can go to the little local newspapers and say, well, did you know, actually, Mr. You know, Fleet Courier, that your town is the number one, selling, you know, number one sex toy place in the UK? And you get lots and lots of coverage very quickly, very widely distributed. And we can do this as well in other countries. So I've just run this for Australia. And I know now that you know, Sydney buys the most penis pumps than anywhere else in Australia. Melbourne is full of douches. Um, <laughs> that is true. That is an actual fact. Um, and, and so this gets you all this local coverage. I can go to the Sydney Morning Herald, who frankly will publish anything, and say, you know, this is a nice, interesting fact about Sydney, and you know, please tell people about lovehoney.com.au. But this is all very well and good. Um, but my number one kind of lesson is to have feet on the ground. And this has been mentioned previously in, in other presentations. Um, it's very important that you actually understand the local culture there. And so this is great. And um, we have Krista, um, who works now uh, in Dallas, uh, in our offices at Love Honey. And she works as our essentially liaison to the larger sex toy community. So she puts in touch with a lovely lady called Erica Moan, um, who does a thing called Ojoy Sex Toy, where she, she essentially draws a cartoon every week about a different type of sex toy. Um, and this, this single uh, cartoon alone, um, sold about 1,000 squeals that week. And that's kind of great. And that gets you people, you know, that gets people into your database. And now we're doing the same in Australia, um, where we have, this is a really bad screenshot, but we have um, Violet, who was actually one of our affiliates, who was doing so well and so kind of engaged that we said, right, we'll just employ you. Be our liaison. Uh, in Australia. And it's important to have a liaison, um, not just for local culture, but also for PR. Because when Variety Rock 105 FM of Boise, Idaho, calls you up and says, um, Matt, I'd like you to speak, I can't do the American accent, Matt, I'd like you to speak on our drive time show about a piece of PR you've done that said aquariums are the best lovers. Um, and so we've got an aquarium rock stars and we want to kind of you to suggest sex toys for them. Um, can you do that? And I said, well, yes, I can, but that will be 3 a.m. in the morning for me. I don't really want to. So having someone actually in the time zone is actually a pretty good thing. Um, so much so, now for Australia, um, that we are uh, just about to open our offices in Brisbane, which is very nice. And now we're sending uh, some of our staff off to Brisbane um, to kind of head up customer service there, um, which will actually allow us to do 24-7 global customer service. So we'll actually cover all time zones, um, only English speaking at the moment, but we'll uh, add more territories to that. Obviously, they're absolutely devastated having to go to Brisbane uh, to have to work. So um, to kind of give you a nice little kind of package uh, of takeaways from this, um, firstly, do all the stuff a startup would do. I think it is a bit bottom feedy, but kind of you just want the data, you want the volume. Um, don't just think about orders, think about microtransactions. Can you get an account? Can you get a mailing list? Can you get anything? Um, once you have them, do everything you can to keep them. Make sure your website has all the functionality that your UK one does. Um, our UK website is responsive. Our .com and .com.au aren't yet, and we should have done that from the start. Localize your PR. So don't just think you know, a global PR initiative. Think of all the little local PR things you can do. Um, and finally, have feet on the ground, not just to get you the local culture, but also to be your local presence within that time zone. And finally, because everything is a selling opportunity, if you go to lovehoney.co.uk forward slash offers and enter code futures, you'll get 20% off your order at Love Honey. Thank you very much. Right, so there's very little I can do to follow that. Uh, but Matty, if you'd like to join us on the stage here, and Paul, if you'd like to come up as well. Uh, we have time for, if we run, a, if we run until 25 past, we've got about um, 12 minutes for doubtless uh, quite a lot of questions. Um, I did have one question to kick off the, uh, or to start the bidding, uh, which is 
a lot of the retailers that I speak to have the, the let's say one of the biggest pain points is the cost of acquisition that you mentioned. Um, what's your number one uh, kind of cost of acquisition busting technique that you've come across in, uh, in your work? Oh, my Lord. Um, PR is cheap. PR is possibly the cheapest way. Um, and because, I mean, you will get links from most local newspapers. I mean, the Daily Mail will not give you a link. Mail Online will not give you a link. Unless you are best friends with them, they will not give you a link for love nor money. Um, and so... Is that, is that outside the sex toy industry as well? Or, uh... I don't know, actually. I haven't asked. I'm actually good friends with the Mail I've got to a point where I actually cut the images in advance for the sidebar of shame. So, so, so they don't even have to do that. Um, uh, but yes, that is, that is by far the cheapest um, way of acquisition. Uh, lead gen is reasonably cheap. Um, you do have to kind of make note about where you're actually storing the data, because if you're acquiring customer details in one country, you can't actually store them in another country without an agreement between the data providers. Can you define lead gen for us, just so oh, we're clear? Essentially, just getting email addresses. Email addresses and names. Um, of people who may be interested in your products and or service. And is that competitions? Because I noticed competitions up it there. Will be, it? it will be mostly competitions. It will be voucher code sites. Um, we tend to use about uh, 10 or 15 different lead gen sources at any one point in time, um, depending upon their varying quality. <laughs> um, but in, in Australia, lead gen is certainly cheaper than it is in the UK. Um, again, as I said before, US lead gen is ridiculously expensive. Mm. Um, we'll tend to pay about 30 pence per lead in the UK. You'd be looking at a pound, two pounds in the US. Okay. Good stuff. Thanks, Matty. Uh, same question to you, Paul. Um, getting new customer acquisition, actually our most cost-effective method isn't actually online. One of the things we do is we actually give to schools loads of our marketing literature and catalogues. They then give them to the kids to take home and then we give the schools a commission, a cut, on everything that's sold. The schools like it, the kids like it, and it works. So a pyramid, then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. OK. Um, so thanks for those guys. Um, we've, got another, we've got another 10 minutes, so uh, just, a quick just on the front here. The, uh, the acquisition in the US. Is it, is it stop doing online marketing completely in the US? Because there's usually a few smoking guns, and you can fix quite easily. Because yeah. Um, we are still looking at lead gen, um, working out the different sources. Affiliates are probably our biggest source um, in the US at the moment. Um, Erica of Vogel Sex Toy continues to be our big number one affiliate. Um, now that we've sorted out all the metas, uh, SEO is working now. Um, PPC, long tail terms, are fine, but generics, where the volume is, it just costs so much money. It's ridiculous. That's, that's possibly. I'll, I'll just be honest. I, I'm a PPC specialist, so I, right. <laughs> I know I know areas and have worked with clients that have the same problems. Yeah. And usually, if if you want to have a chat afterwards, I can tell sure. you a few. It, we, 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 <laughs> we have optimised it to the hilt as much as we can. Um, but something like sex toys or, vibra or vibrators, you can say, well, okay, well, I'll only show uh, you know the West Coast post 8 p.m. and to these types of people on these devices it still costs you a bloody fortune. It's all about quality score. I'm yeah. <laughs> uh, any more questions, please? Stunned into silence. <laughs> Very good. So, um, please. With regards to building volume quickly and, and getting your database for people in the states who don't know your brand from Adam. A lot of the tactics that you talked about are, are brand specific. They, they work for your brand. Some of the fashion brands are, are very precious, and rightly so, about, about where they're featured initially. I mean, they're not going to go on Quidco, they're not go, or the US version. They're not going to, they're very precious about even being on platforms. So with regards to Amazon and all those, which I think are, are some good good tactics as well. Is there anything, any, any other ways um, that you think are important for brands like that that are a bit more, uh, a le yeah. less nimble in terms of all of those if, marketing if, channels? If you can afford to be precious, um, then you can afford to spend some serious bucks on marketing. 
because that'll, that'll do it. I mean, Zalando, for a start, have, have grown very fast by essentially pouring tons of money into marketing. Um, if, you, if you want to do it on the cheap, not sure if you can, um, but I would say your traditional social media. I mean, social, the reason I didn't mention social media is because it doesn't work for Love Honey, because people don't say, yes, I bought this giant pup plug. <laughs> you know, they, they, they just don't do that. Um, and we've been kicked off of Facebook so many times, and you, our lovely YouTube channel has just been turned off overnight with no warning, really? and then you have to send flowers to the guys at YouTube, and then maybe you'll get it back on. Um, Did you give them free products? We don't, actually, because we think, well, you know, I'm going to send you flowers. If I send you a giant vibrator, are you going to freak out even further? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but do the social media. So, obviously, your blogger engagements, um, getting people talking about your brand as much as possible. You can still do a fair few PR wheezes. Um, you can get, you know, pay someone to wear your clothes at somewhere special, uh, which people will all be happy to take money for, um, and do it that way. But it's going to cost you more money. Same question to Paul as well. We're in a different stage of the journey. You know, we haven't yet taken our branded site to a foreign country. So I'm sort of listening to Matty here going, wow, this is interesting stuff, <laughs> writing it all down. And our product is very different. We're not sexy. There's no doubt oh. about it. The Daily <laughs> Mail column of shame is well, not interested in children's crafts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that pink column on the website, we all know which one it is. We've all looked at it. Children's crafts, you know, it really doesn't happen, does it? Oh, so you what just we've need got to find something unusually shaped. So we're, <laughs> uh, <laughs> true. <laughs> we're, we're more into glues, you're more into lubricants. We yes, have to accept that. True. Um, we do Easter bunnies, you do rabbits. Yep. These are all contrasts. I think what we've got to do is get people talking about us. So get people who are passionate about crafting, blogging about us, writing about us on social media, giving them the product to try, and then writing about it because our product doesn't cost much to give to people to give, get them to try and then get them talking about it, engaging with it and using social media to build our brand in that way. Yeah. Pay-per-click, we typically spend on the UK on non-brand marketing, non-brand terms, 28p. Mm. Yeah, that, that works for us fine, but we're not going to pay £1.92. Yeah. Mm. You know, so we have to kind of build it up through engaging people with a product. And PR is less going to be less good for us because just we're not just not sexy. That's life. Good stuff. Thanks for those guys. Um, one more question over here, Fraser. Yeah, I was just going to ask. So one of the biggest challenges, and a few of the speakers have mentioned it, is um, is the channel conflict issue, particularly if you've got a wholesale business or you've got a stores business. And um, have you had to consider that in your plans to go abroad, or have you just looked at the market opportunity and gone in wholeheartedly? Yeah, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, you have to do a bit of a back of a fag packet calculation on how much you're going to sell via another channel versus if you do it on your own website. Um, currently in the US, for most of our licenses, um, it will be far more profitable to sell it on another site, give them exclusives. Um, I would love to be able to kind of leverage one of our licenses. I mean, we've just got the license for um, Betty Page now, who is a kind of a well-known 50s burlesque artist. Um, and I'd love to be able to launch that as an exclusive on uh, lovehoney.com as, as a way of kind of getting people to the site. But if I do that, we just won't sell enough to cost, you know, to warrant the cost of the license. So ultimately, it comes down, down to financials. Paul, any cannibalization? We are doing wholesale internationally. We've started off doing it. What we've found mostly is the countries who are interested in selling our products wholesale are not the countries we've approached for direct. So we'll get Belgians, Dutch, Czechs, Poles, Romanians, Australians. And we're selling quite a lot of product, particularly to Australia at the moment, wholesale. But we're not getting that interest wholesale from the States, France or Germany yet. So there isn't a conflict yet. Mm -hmm. But if it arose, we make a much higher margin on our own product. Right. We sell it direct, we're getting 75%. We sell it wholesale, we might get 50 We'll weigh that up. If we could sell it direct, we'd like to. Very good. Um, just in the interest of time, uh, we, we're going to wrap up with the, uh, the one final inevitable question about, uh, about your one golden nugget of, uh, of, <laughs> of recommendations. Uh, I was going to offer, actually, um, if you wanted feedback on why owls are so successful in Germany, Axel's over from, uh, from Germany, from the Intershop team, and also uh, <laughs> if you wanted to know any, anything about the noddiness of Australia, uh, Shane's from Australia as well, so he can, uh, <laughs> he can give you some insights into, uh, into that. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, my final, my final question just to round things up uh, is, 
uh, what would be your uh, one uh, kind of pearl of wisdom that you'd like to leave the audience with today? Um, the US is big, flashy, and glamorous, and a very nice looking slice of pie. Um, but the British have somewhat um, historical uh, lack of ability to conquer <laughs> the US. Um, so don't immediately look at the US as your number one goal. There are lots of other opportunities. Thanks, Matty. And the same question to you, Paul. I think what he's telling me is don't focus on the States. <laughs> um, and you're losing money on it, I guess, <laughs> as well. Uh, I mean, my, my, my nugget would be you've got not just to sell your products to people overseas, you've got to fulfill it to them at a price they're prepared to pay and make sure they get it in a form and in a time scale they're happy with. So you've got to deal with the logistics side of the business as well. And also, if you've got your own warehouse and your own fulfillment, you may have to deal with issues of customs, documentation, you've got to deal with for selling outside the EU. You don't want your people in the warehouse to be filling in a form and sticking it to the box because it just slows them down. You'll find your orders become unprofitable. You need to completely automate that process so our people in the warehouse, they get an order, they put, peel off the label, they press a button, the customs label is automatically pre-produced with the value and everything gets stuck on the box, it takes them a second. And that makes sure that the process of fulfillment is effective. Because if you can't fulfill the sales, you'll just get terrible, terrible reviews and they'll want to buy the stuff again. <laughs> Very good, okay. Uh, so uh, I guess that leaves me to wrap up, uh, which I hadn't actually thought about until just now. So I uh, wanted to say thanks to everybody for coming down and spending the morning, uh, taking some, some of your valuable time to uh, see these excellent presentations. So thanks to all our speakers uh, and our panelists. Uh, and again, thanks to all our, our co-sponsors for helping to put this all together. Um, and we're going to be circulating around uh, uh, downstairs if anyone wants to chat to uh, any of the folks who put this day on today. Uh, and other than that, uh, thanks very much for joining. Anthony, did you have any final closing comments? Final closing remarks from you next week. Make sure you fill in your feedback form. Yeah, we really, really appreciate it. Very good. Thanks all for coming. Have a good day. Thanks.